One of the biggest problems we have in decarbonizing our electricity grid is the best wind and solar resources are not necessarily near where people live. Here we see a map of the best places for solar and wind energy compared with the U.S. population density. And even if you have good solar resources nearby, it's best to balance them with wind to get electricity at night. And even if you have great wind resources, it's best to balance them with wind in a different region so you still have access to power regardless of the weather. Which is why we need a metagrid that spans the country, as I talked about in my very first video. But this requires laying new high voltage transmission lines that cross multiple states. We're going to take a look at the Grain Belt Express Transmission Line Project as an example of the challenges of building these long distance transmission lines and how the National Interest Electric Transmission Corridors, hereafter referred to as Electric Transmission Corridors, may help. We'll also look at the comments from Senator Josh Hawley and explore the misinformation he's putting into the congressional record. One of the challenges in building a metagrid that's fit for purpose for delivering renewable power across the country is that no one is responsible for meeting our national transmission needs. Almost all of the transmission lines are built by one of the 3,000 local utilities or a handful of regional organizations like the Bonneville Power Administration and the Tennessee Valley Authority. The federal government can designate electric transmission corridors, but they can't build transmission lines to meet the needs, only expedite the approvals and lend money. Kansas has the potential to generate about 3 million gigawatt hours of electricity from wind power, compared to the U.S. demand in 2022 of 4 million gigawatt hours. In other words, the wind power in Kansas could produce 75% of the electricity consumed in the U.S. at a reasonable cost. I'm not suggesting that would be a good idea, but 10% would be. But instead, Kansas wind power provides only about 40% of the needs of Kansas. The rest of that potential is trapped behind a lack of transmission, allowing it to get to market. The Grain Belt Express was first proposed in 2013 by Clean Line Energy to help solve that problem. The route is shown on this map, going from Dodge City, Kansas, which has world-class wind resources, to the Illinois-Indiana border. If built, it will be able to move 5 gigawatts of power, the equivalent of four large nuclear power plants, across the territory of three regional transmission organizations, SPP, MISO, and PJM. Clean Line Energy was unable to complete the project, and it's now being developed by Invergy. But if you want to connect wind power in Kansas to the demand to the east, you'll need to go through Missouri, where there have been problems. The Missouri legislature considered a bill that would constrain the use of eminent domain for electricity transmission, but not for other uses like real estate development or pipelines. From my research, it seems like Missouri has seen some abuse with land being declared blighted and eminent domain used to allow real estate developers to buy land for marginal public good. But the law proposed would not address the real abuses, and the Grain Belt Express wasn't abusing eminent domain. This was a project with significant public good. Luckily, the proposal to allow county commissions to veto development, which would have made building transmission through Missouri impossible, was killed. The challenges to complete the project were insurmountable, at least before revenue started rolling in. So the developer is focused on just the parts in Kansas and Missouri. To complete the first phase of the project, developers needed to acquire an easement on 1,700 properties across Kansas and Missouri. Most of these will be negotiated. The developers have the right to use eminent domain in Missouri after receiving the blessing of the Public Service Commission, which they did in 2019. Grain Belt Express offered landowners 110% of fair market value and reached agreements with 65% of the parcels voluntarily by 2021. But at that point, they resorted to using eminent domain for the first time and brought a landowner to court. By 2023, they had acquired 95% of the easements needed in Kansas and Missouri. They also agreed going forward to pay 150% of fair market value. 
So this project has suffered through multiple state hearings, legislative battles, negotiations with thousands of landowners and county commission meetings over the last 11 years and still hasn't laid a single mile of transmission cable or even meaningfully engaged with stakeholders in two of the four states they plan to build in. It doesn't have to be this way. Gas and oil pipeline permitting is managed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, and this process works much better than working with every state and county along the way. For instance, the 303-mile-long Mountain Valley project is considered much delayed, but it's ready for gas to flow 10 years after being proposed, about half the time it takes to get an electric transmission line built. To expedite and streamline the process for electrical transmission, the Federal Power Act of 2005 authorizes the Secretary of Energy to designate any geographic area as an electric transmission corridor if the Secretary finds that consumers are harmed by a lack of transmission in the area and that the development of new transmission would advance important national interests in that area, such as increased reliability and reduced consumer costs. This is based on the triannual National Electric Transmission Congestion Study, and I'll include a link to the most current one in the description. Here we see a map of the 10 regions that have been proposed by the Department of Energy as electric transmission corridors, including the Midwest Plains Corridor that would follow the path of the Grain Belt Project. An electric transmission corridor designation can unlock federal financing tools, specifically public-private partnerships through the $2.5 billion Transmission Facilitation Program under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the $2 billion Transmission Facility Financing Program under the Inflation Reduction Act. More importantly, Electric Transmission Corridor designation also allows FERC to issue permits for the siting of transmission lines within the corridor under circumstances where state siting authorities do not have the authority to site the line, have not acted on an application for over one year, or have denied an application. This basically aligns the process for electrical transmission with that for gas and oil pipelines, but only within the corridors and only after a year is lost waiting for the states to act. This helps, but doesn't solve the basic problem. Under the current system, the only way to build transmission that crosses regional transmission organization boundaries is by a private developer deciding there's enough money to be made to work the process for 20 years, with the chance of failure constantly present. If they're working inside an electric transmission corridor, and remember, none of them exist yet, then they might only have to wait for 10 years to start seeing a return on their investment. The state of California's transmission plan does include some money for building transmission outside of their territory. So that is the rare exception that I'm aware of. If you can think of another, please add it to the comments. In my first video, I suggested a possible solution that the federal government take responsibility for building a grid that spans the country from coast to coast. Check out the link for that below if you're interested in learning more about that concept. Now let's take a look at Josh Hawley's comments as a member of the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. As I've mentioned a number of times in this committee, one of the top energy issues in my state, maybe the top energy issue, has been electric transmission lines. I definitely agree. We have a corporation in the state of Missouri, Invenergy, that has used eminent domain to confiscate farmers' lands to run land, rather, to run transmission lines through the state of Missouri. Now, as originally planned, these lines weren't even going to benefit Missourians at all. No Missouri farmers, no Missouri consumers were going to get anything. During the construction phase, there would be $1.3 billion of activity in Missouri. Landowners are paid at least 110% of fair market value, plus $18,000 for each tower on their property, and they can still farm the land in the right-of-way. 
In the original proposal, about 500 megawatts of electricity would have been sold in Missouri, which would have reduced electric bills by tens of millions of dollars per year. In addition, there would have been significant tax revenue generated. Maybe for Senator Hawley, that would have been nothing, but to many, that might have been what allows a farm to stay in the family. This company came in, took the farmer's land, did not compensate them. This is a bizarre statement. Josh Hawley has a law degree from Yale and was Attorney General of Missouri, and I've got to believe he knows eminent domain law better than I do. But even I know that you can be forced to sell your land, but you must be compensated at fair market value. The developer actually agreed to compensate at 150% of fair market value in the final segment. The fair market value is determined by a commission in the county where the land lies, not by the company. Finally, Mr. Chairman, the answer was farmers were able to go to the state legislature. It required the passage of a new state law to get farmers compensated. The act, as proposed, was basically to kill the project by giving every county commission veto power on the entire line. This part did not make it into law. The developers supported a section to increase compensation, which was passed into law. Here's my concern, Mr. Chairman, and why it relates to FERC. Under the new authorities adopted by Congress in the Infrastructure Act a couple of years ago, the Department of Energy now has the ability to designate state transmission lines as national transmission corridors. Let me show you a map. And recently, the Department of Energy has done just that. Once the Department of Energy designates a particular through route as a national transmission line, FERC has the ability under the new statute to countermand state authorities, essentially to bypass the state process, regulatory process, and designate the land, including potentially taking it. I asked all three of the FERC nominees about this, said to them, will you guarantee to me that you will consider the interests of farmers, local residents, landowners, the kind of people who frankly don't hire lobbyists this is not a new authority, but one granted in 2005, and it's one in line with FERC's authority for gas and oil pipelines. If he's concerned about how FERC will manage the trade-offs with electricity, a compelling case would have been to cite abuses by FERC when dealing with oil and gas pipelines, rather than some hypothetical. But he provided no such examples, and I'm unaware of any. But if you are, please share them in the comments. Normally, when someone says something wrong, I assume they haven't looked into the issue and spoke off the cuff, or they're confused, or maybe they chose their words poorly. I've been known to have a brain glitch and say the opposite of what I mean. But given Senator Hawley's impressive legal credentials and that these were prepared remarks, I'm going to pull out the liar, liar, pants on fire label. If you think what he said was not a lie, please make your case in the comments below. There's a fun video on the Clean Belt Express by Half as Interesting, and I'll put a link to that below. If you've learned something, please like and subscribe, and you can support the channel by buying me a coffee. My next video will be on FERC Order 1920, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but it is. And the link to that will be in my transmission playlist that you can find here. And please share this video with anyone who you think will enjoy watching Josh Hawley fleeing the Capitol with his pants on fire.